morning, everyone. And uh, Dr. Jubin has already detailed nicely about how we take care of the inpatient hyperglycemia. Now, whenever we have an inpatient situation, it is always different. So we, we may not have the same situation every day. We will always have a different case. So each day, I, I always tell my residents, every patient is different. So you learn from each case. Don't think that once you have seen diabetes, you don't need to see. You need to see each per patient because each patient teaches you something. So that's why I put the management in five case scenarios. So I'll just go through quickly through those five case scenarios, and I'll just give an overview that how we do the management. So. This is just the basic thing because whenever a patient is admitted for any surgery or any procedure, we know that their nutritional intake is altered. They are not doing physical activity. They are, they are not doing the usual activity because many of them may be doing some exercises, which they are not obviously able to do because they are on bed. They might be getting a different sort of nutrition and your dietitian has to be in collaboration with you because she may give something which you don't want that patient to get. So all these things have to be collaborated. That's all very important. And obviously we know sometimes they are on parental nutrition, sometimes they are not getting the proper nutrition, they are taking very small feeds, which Dr. Jubin also alluded to, and there may be a change in the clinical status, sometimes they get some complication of surgery, like suppose a patient is post-op and now gets a pulmonary embolism and you have given insulin and patient all of a sudden gets shifted to ICU, so whole scenario changes, so that's where our patient develops some complication of the surgery, something, and is kept NPO, so all these things change. Sorry. I can do from here, right? I can do from here, it's not. It's not happening. Huh, yeah. So this is already told that whenever you have any patient, whether it is admitted for any procedure or any surgery or anything, we need to see that we have to have a HbA1c test done on that patient because anybody having a glucose value which is beyond 140 demands that we need to check and we always, in our hospital, anybody having beyond 100, it's always better to check to be sure because post-op complication rates may be much, much higher if we don't take care of the glucose pre-op. Again, it's not moving. It, we have to do it from here only. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll do it from here. So we know, and another important thing before I go to the case scenarios that perioperative glucose values have been found to be more strongly related to the surgical complications than the pre-op. So that is why perioperative control is a very, very important thing. And we have to see that what type of diabetes the patient is having, whether the patient was prior on insulin or oral anti-diabetic drugs, what is the control? Because many times you will have situations where patient is admitted for urgent surgery, and then you don't have much to do. You have to take care and see that the things are done. And some patients who have been uh, planned for surgery, then the situation is different. You get ample time of two weeks or three weeks. But sometimes you just get four hours or one hour. And you may get a call that this is an urgent surgery, do something. So that is why we have to be ready for all these situations. So, and also very important because like now the new guidelines are very clear that we should not give any carbohydrate containing fluids orally before the surgery, which used to be a practice long time in the past. So coming to my first case, now this is a 48 years old lady who has, who is a type two, who is admitted for laparoscopic cholecystectomy now. Um, now you have got a call today. You are the treating doctor, you, are, you, you get a call today, one day prior, because obviously that will be the situation. And normally in our hospital, sometimes we get one hour prior also, but for these type of situations, they normally call a day prior. So you get a call a day prior that she's admitted, tomorrow morning is the surgery, HbA1c, you see it's seven. And every other parameter is okay, and she is on oral anti-diabetic, she is on glimmer provide in metformin. So can audience tell me what will you do? What is the best thing to do? Next best step I've written, we have to withhold the OADs because she is going for a surgery. So anything else you want to do? You have to do the glucose values, you have to check her glucose values. Yes, absolutely. Then else, anything else? Because I have stopped the oral antidiabetic, her glucose values will go high. So I have to give her some amount of insulin. So I'll put her on insulin. I'll put her... This is not moving at all. Huh. So we start with the basal bolus insulin. Like, it's not that we exactly fix the dose. We have to give a sort of a correction dose, seeing how she is taking, what type of food she is going to eat, because she may be eating less, she may be anxious, she may not be feeling good to eat. So you accordingly decide and see her prior requirements, like we, now we see she is requiring glimepiride and metformin, 4 mg she is taking, and 1,000 milligram. So I decide and I give a short acting, and I give some amount of long acting, but I don't give a very huge dose, and I just monitor in the night also, and then see the fasting and then take a call. I'll tell you what to do next. 
And post-op, once she is orally allowed, that time I will prefer to give her subcute at that time. Once she is orally allowed, till that time we'll manage with the IV insulin uh, infusion if needed, or with the neutralization of the IV fluids with insulin. That way we can manage. I'll go next and tell you. I'll, I'm coming to that also. So now perioperative period, in such cases, we better stop the OADs, we shift the patient to insulin, and we titrate, not like we fix the dose. We can't fix the dose. We have to see how much is a post-dinner, give a correction dose at that time, give her a sm small amount of basal as well, so that next day morning when she goes for surgery, the things are done properly. So these are the various guidelines which Dr. Jubin already alluded to. So now this new thing, like obviously they are telling the DPP-4 inhibitors, we can still continue, but not in surgery patients. When the, this is for overall when the patient is admitted, but when the patient is going for surgery, it's always the safest bet to shift on insulin later on once the patient is post-op to shift to oral anti-diabetic drugs as and when you think that the situation is right and the patient is going to be okay with that. And obviously, if a patient is a type 1, then we have a little bit of a different management because we can't just totally stop the insulin at totally because they will have problems. So we have to give the basal insulin. We have to give a lesser dose. We might reduce it by 50% or something. And then we have to manage with the IV fluids alongside because these are the patients, if you don't, just like in type 2, you may not give and the patient may go for surgery and come back. But the thing is, in a type 1, it can be a prolonged gap and the chances of diabetic keto ketosis will be very high. So in that cases, we don't give the short acting, but we give the long acting in a reduced dose, and we have to see the monitoring of the glucose values, and then we titrate accordingly the IV fluids. Type 2 diabetes, also like suppose a patient is already on treatment and the glucose values are very high, it's always good to send the patient on simultaneous IV fluids with the insulin infusion because that's the best way to manage. Otherwise, some people, if they don't have much of the support system for the infusion pump separately, then it is neutralized. The fluid is only, we add the insulin and we can accordingly titrate, but that becomes a little bit difficult in patients, especially who have uncontrolled glucose values, because then once you have added a fixed dose of insulin and the glucose values start going up or down, it becomes very difficult. So there an IV insulin infusion would be a better protocol with the IV fluids. Have I exceeded the time? No. <laughs> okay. So the target for the perioperative period as per the ADA is like 80 to 180. Tighter glycemic controls have not been found to improve the outcomes in most of the situations. And we have to check the glucose values at least four to six hours. If the patient is on IV insulin infusion, then a frequent monitoring 30 minutes to two hourly, depending on the clinical situation, has to be done. Now coming to the second case, this is a 52 years old gentleman who is not a known case of type two. His pre-op HPA1C was 6.2. I'm sure doc in critical care, our next speaker will be talking about it, but I'm just alluding to a little bit on that because I have to cover the peri-op workups. So now this patient is post CABG three days. Now you get a call from the cardiologist, the glucose values are shooting up, all are beyond 180, 200, 250 plus. What is the next best step? The battery is running low. It'll switch off. So yes, you have to, that's because it's less than 200, 180, it's okay, but anything else you would like to do now in the present situation, it's not beyond 250 most of the times, all the glucose values are 200, 210 plus. So what would you like to do? We'd like to start insulin because this patient is post-op, right? So I have already written it, so you have to start insulin and you have to but accordingly give... Yes. Not, 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 not in a post This is a perioperative situation. Perioperative. Yeah. In a Otherwise, yes. Situation. When the patient is going home, I'm coming to that. Then we can add the DPP-4. We can add the SGLT-2 also if the patient is fine. But this patient is a different scenario. He is a pre-diabetic. Now he has because got a sort of a stress hyperglycemia. Yeah. Yeah. Even in liver hospital, they are so scared. They give all anticoagulants and managers, but when it comes to fill this load every day, your own electrophysiology, he will allow me to prescribe insulin. When I add a small dose of basal insulin, he doesn't know much about it. Maybe you will have to educate the cardiologist. Then that is why I just say sometimes the DPP board will give us. Yeah. So, uh, so we know that stress hyperglycemia is another entity which we need to be aware of because that further exacerbates the complications. These guidelines, Dr. Jubin has already alluded to. Why I put it here? Because there are 
uh, some things which are which are important for the man management of perioperative hyperglycemia, which also these guidelines talk about. And these are very good comprehensive guidelines. We all should go back and read it thoroughly because these are the ones which can help us in our clinical practice as well. So surgical procedures, as we already discussed, it's between 140 to 180 post-op is what we are trying to keep. Cardiac ICUs, our patients post CABGs and all, if you are able to avoid the hypo and you can keep a bit lower, it will be good for the outcome. Now the third case is, this is my second last case, so it's a 54 years old type 2 diabetes patient who has got admitted for an IV zolindronic acid infusion. She has no other comorbidity which, which, because of which we need to change her anti-diabetic drugs. She is already taking some anti-diabetic drugs which according to her present condition are fine with her and her HbA1c is 6.8 and she is 54 years. What is the best approach? She'll take her injection and go, so do you want to do something or you just you want to um, just send her home or you, you are okay with this? Anybody? She is a known diabetic, long, long duration. We have evaluated her for all the complications. That all is fine. But anything else you would like to do for her? I, uh, OADs, OADs, I, OADs. I've written that whatever uh, anti-diabetic, I just, because to make it short, I had written like that. So she is on oral anti-diabetic drugs, which she is, which there is no contraindication for use in her case. Her, all the other functions are normal. So in this case, the best approach would be obviously, we can continue, we need not touch, but, we have to understand one thing. Whenever you get a diabetic patient who gets admitted for anything, make it a point to see that you have evaluated for all the complications, whether it is periop, whether it is critical care, non-critical care. Please make it a point to evaluate for complication and educate the patient. That's the most important. This is the time which also the guidelines are not recommending. This is the time when you should educate. She is there in the hospital. She is fine. But please educate her for future management and complications and if possible, a little bit about the nutrition as well. That's a good time when you can talk to the patient. They are very receptive at that time. This is the fourth case. She is a 62 years old lady who has been admitted for breast CA. She is undergoing chemo. Now it's a common protocol. They'll come one day, take the chemotherapy, go home. That's a daycare. And she is given uh, steroids on the day of the chemotherapy as a protocol. Before that, she, when she came to the hospital, her morning glucose value was 280. That time she had not received steroids. She is given steroids later during the day and the next glucose value is 400 now. And she is on oral anti-diabetic drugs. Renal and liver functions are normal. She has been tolerating. This is approximately the fourth cycle of her chemo. Now what to do? No, she is a known diabetic. She has come to you. Now she has come to the hospital today. She is already on oral anti-diabetic drugs. I've written she is on oral anti-diabetic drugs. She is on oral anti-diabetic drugs. She has come to the hospital today. You find her glucose value 280. Now what to do? Now you gave her steroids, it obviously went up, that's because steroid. But before that only it was 280. We don't have her prior HbA1c, she is undergoing chemotherapy, she is having a lot of RBC uh, catabolism and other things, so you may not get a very good picture with HbA1c today, but we know her glucose values are over or uncontrolled. So we give her insulin, yes. So first thing is we check ketones because her initial glucose value itself is 280. It's better to check ketones. It's always better to do this. And then obviously we have to do the next best step. So start her on insulin. She will definitely require basal bolus because such situations we normally prefer to give them basal bolus or later on shift to premix. Sometimes they are not very receptive to take basal bolus. They are already troubled with the chemo and all. They are depressed. We try to manage sometimes with premix, but sometimes they are vomiting and all. So premix may be a little bit difficult option. Initially start with basal bolus. Call them into the hospital on the follow-up visit. They are anyways going to come for the next chemo. See them then. Adjust the dose. And you can always think about giving some of the other anti-diabetic like metformin and all. Lower dose can be continued if the my vomiting is not severe or she's okay otherwise fine because that takes care otherwise you'll need to give too high a dose of insulin and a lot of erraticity will happen this is my last case the 5, 5 56 year old gentleman who has come with now an infection now he has come today the surgeon has informed you i'm going to remove i'm going to take out the pus remove the nail and send the patient home tell me what to do patient is already on three oral anti-diabetic drugs what is the next step i've written it already so we start insulin, there's an infection, you have to start, this is a daycare, but you have to start because patient is going home, but that doesn't mean that we just send like that, this is a different scenario altogether. Yeah. There's an infection. Creatinine is normal. 
Creatinine is normal. Other functions are normal. The patient only has uncontrolled glucose values. HbA1c is 8.7. Patient can continue metformin and GPP-4. Metformin, in case the patient is on antibiotic or anything or acute infection, we hold. After that, we can restart. That is what we will do. SGLT2, definitely we start, stop in this situation. Premix insulin can be given for because patient will be more receptive because now he has come. You just put on that. Continue. Maybe low dose of metformin and everything else is fine. If it's a very severe infection, stop it. Continue insulin control and then add. So we also have insulin infusion protocol. Whenever a patient is very, very sick or like sick in the sense that the glucose values are very high pre-op, it's always better, as Dr. Juvin also alluded to, to give IV insulin infusion. That's the best way out. You can't keep on giving some subcute and monitoring whole night. It has to be the IV insulin, which has to be continued with the parallel fluids, which can be NS if it is higher glucose value. Otherwise, you can give uh, the DNS accordingly, whatever the glucose values are. And this can be the best way to send the patient to the OT because otherwise the patient reaches the OT, the glucose value is 450, you will get a call, they'll send the patient back. And the whole blame comes on the diabetologist or the endocrinologist. So we should never get into that. We should see to it that the glucose value should be well controlled. Also, studies have shown that in, before the surgery, one to four hours before the surgery, glucose control is also a, a marker or the it, it predicts the post-op complications. So one to four hours before the surgery, also glucose control is very, very important. So that's why we can do this at the, with the uh, this can be the best. Other thing is fewer things, which we may not be using too much, but we all are star have started using it now, and the, most of the centers are using it. So CGM can be used in the post-op situations also, because not that it is the replacement of your capillary or your blood glucose. It can help you to manage accordingly, because there'll be a lot of fluctuations in a post-op. You go and write a correction dose, and you think patient is going to eat, and the patient eats, and he vomits. And then what to do? So you keep on pricking. It's, it's too much for the patient. It's too much stress for the patient. Already the surgery is a stress. So what's the best way out? Do, put a CGM also. No problem. Monitor that. Monitor the capillary. Monitor the other values. No problem. But CGM will give you a minute, uh, uh, like a real-time assessment of what's happening. You can take a better decision, and it will be easy for the attenders also to do. They can take care, and things can be managed better. So CGM is also another good option. Some of the patients, you will get situations like this where you have patients who are on insulin pump. You can continue in the daycare. So if it's a daycare setting, you can safely continue. You might have to do some adjustment of the basal as well as the bolus shots accordingly as per whatever the patient's appetite and things are. And then accordingly, you can adjust the dose. So Dr. I'll not Pramila, go much. I'll uh, ask you a few questions now. Yeah, yeah I'm just finishing off. <laughs> I'm so, so sorry I'm finishing off. So just, I, it's the last one. Inpatient education, that's what I just wanted to stress on. Whenever a patient is admitted for surgery, please see to it that the inpatient education for any daycare or this is done alongside as a part of it. I'll not go into the details of basal bolus. We have to do the correctional dose and titrate. Thank you.